Growing up, my family had nothing, but we also had everything. Both of my parents worked multiple jobs so they could provide for us, but in return, we were expected to make the most of everything they worked for. After grocery shopping, my brother or I would haul the 50 pound bag of rice into the home. My mother taught me to rinse the rice three times until the water is mostly clear. Poke your finger to the bottom of the pot and the rice should come up to your first joint and the water to your second joint. My story actually begins before me in April of 1981. My mom moved from Seoul, South Korea to Los Angeles when she was 25. Her mother, my harmony, which is grandma in Korean, was 60 and had flown into LA beforehand to scope it out. And she's the start of our family on my mother's side. She was the first Christian, grew up without parents, and started several Methodist churches throughout South Korea. Actually, this little rice cooker was hers, and it's older than me. My grandma has 10 kids, or had 10 kids, my mother being number eight. So kids number eight, nine, and 10, my mom, uncle, and aunt packed their bags and moved to the US along with her. In May of 1983, my mom was leaving work at a bank in LA when a man asked her if she was selling her Monte Carlo. And her car was in terrible shape, but she was so excited that she didn't think it was odd at all when she gave the man her phone number. Fast forward a year and a half, and this man and her were married and my brother was born. My dad was a struggling actor at the time, turned letter carrier for the post office. He was born in England to an English mother and an American father who was serving in the Air Force while stationed in England. They moved to California when my dad was a kid, and there he grew up with the Hollywood dream. Together, my parents slowly saved to build more. When it comes to money and numbers, my mom is a genius. I like to think I get my resourcefulness and analytical skills from her and my creativity from my dad. In 1992, LA was completely on fire, literally and figuratively, and not due to natural causes. So side note, if you have a strong stomach and a Netflix account, I recommend watching LA 92. I'll link it below. My parents made the decision at this point to move up to Northern California. Life in Sacramento was a dream for us. My parents bought their first home, three bedrooms, two bath, 1,000 square feet, and it makes me giggle and realize how blessed I am when I think that my 700 square foot apartment is small. When we had four of us in that small home, and that home carries some of the best memories of my life. You could speak in the normal volume and hold a conversation with someone in the opposite corner of that house. It was laid out in such a way that you can run around it in a complete circle, which led to countless hours and days of my brother chasing me and vice versa. It had a treehouse in the back where my brother would make me play 10 minutes of army with him if he played 10 minutes of Barbies with me. But it wasn't all fun and games, like summers were the worst. My mom would give us homework like crazy. I wished I was in summer school. So she would get us math books and make us read entire novels in a day to include an essay due by the time she got home. So my brother and I, we'd rush like the last hour of each day. Sometimes it, our work would be acceptable, but other times our essays on the books that we barely skimmed because back then Google wasn't around, they were typically called trash by my mom, and rightfully so. She would rip it up into a million pieces of shame, and then we'd be told to do it again the next day in addition to our regular workload. She was able to manage our educations while working a full-time job and going to community college and working part-time as a waitress. I can't even imagine doing that today and I don't even have a husband or kids. I think the hustle of the immigrant generation is more than anyone else because they risk everything. Our family outings weren't like regular outings either. <laughs> they were always serving some sort of purpose such as the whole family going to Walmart because my brother needed socks or my mom taking my brother and I to Folsom prison to show us that this is what happens when you don't study or listen to your parents. I do speak Korean, definitely not perfectly by any means, but my mom spoke to us growing up, especially if she didn't want my dad to know what she was saying. And he would start to pick up on contextual clues, such as if he heard her using appa, which means dad, um, she would, or he would know that she was talking about him, so she started changing it to kusharam, which literally means that person, or she'd say that person I'm married to. 
Sundays were always reserved for church. We would do early service at American Church at Calvary Chapel, then drop my dad off at home, then go to Korean Church until like 2, sometimes 3 p.m. I really liked American Church. Korean Church was the first time I actually ever felt like an outsider. I'd have to go to a class full of girls my age, and they all treated me like I wasn't really one of them. I did have one friend though, this girl named Hannah. One summer when I was 10 or 11, my brother and I went to this art camp. This was the first time I ever faced a racist remark. I must have bothered one of the girls in my cabin because I turned around and while I was turned, she did that thing where she pulled the skin on her temples outward to make her eyes smaller and another girl told her not to do that. It really did hurt me. We were never really grounded as kids. <laughs> We were kind of already grounded by default, so if we wanted to go somewhere, we had a state when, with who, where, how long, and what their parents did for a living. And then my parents decided if we could go or not. Same requirements applied for money. We were never given money, so I hoarded any money I got during my birthday, Christmas, and New Year's. My parents stopped buying me clothes when I was about 10. I would go to the garage and find old clothing and cut them up and sew new things out of them. Money was scarce. I would go recycling with my dad and he would sometimes give me an allowance from that. Every day in middle school, my mom drove an hour just to drop us off so that we could go to the rich middle school and not the one in our neighborhood where many of the boys became drug dealers. Several girls gave birth at 13. The school's the opposite. I used to paint my Adidas sneakers with nail polish on the stripes and the heels so that they would match each outfit the next day just so I could fit in. My parents always emphasized though the importance of traveling and learning other cultures to us, which I so much appreciate. And that's why I'm cooking a traditionally Thai dish today. Also, I just really had a craving. Also, I feel like when I eat the rice coming from this rice cooker that I'm being fed by generations of hard work and it reminds me to be thankful for the blessings that they worked for. I still get asked frequently what ethnicity I am and personally I don't mind when it's someone I know or it's genuinely asked in a kind tone. I don't think though it's something you should ask within the first 30 seconds of meeting someone. It comes off a bit rude. I think if someone wants you to know what they are that they'll tell you, otherwise it's irrelevant. To Asians I'm white, to non-Asians I'm Chinese or Japanese. But there are so many cultures and subcultures in Asia and within Asian Americans in the world. 23andMe says I'm only 39% Korean, the other 11 is mixed, and I feel 100. And also says I'm 49% mixed with Western European, but I also feel 100. I took an oath saying that I'm 100% American, which is truly what I believe I am. If you enjoyed my video, give me a thumbs up. If you hated it, you can give me a thumbs down, but you can also subscribe to me, hit the red link below, and follow me on Insta. Thank you guys for your time.